All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session, Ensuring Equity in Virtual Public Involvement. We've got a great uh, hour planned for you here today. Just wanna walk through what we're gonna do real quick. Uh, the first portion of the session is gonna be some quick presentations from each of our presenters uh, talking about their area of expertise. Uh, and then after that, we'll go into an open discussion. So. The, you know, the, the purpose, the main, the main point of this discussion is to be a panel. We want, we want your input, we want your questions. So please um, go ahead and start typing your questions in that question and answer pod. I will be moderating and sending those questions around to our speakers, um, but hopefully we'll get a, a good dose of, of, of feedback and input from our audience. So um, just by way of introductions here, we have three speakers with us today. The first is Carolyn Nelson. She is a civil engineer, project development, and environmental specialist with FH, FHWA's Office of the Project Development and Environmental Review. Um, and she's worked on the um, Everyday Counts initiatives for virtual public involvement. Uh, we also have Allison Hastings. She is the Associate Director of Community Communications and Engagement for the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. And then finally, we have Yanisa Sechagomtan, and Yanisa is an Associate Transportation Planner with Nelson Nygaard. So I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn to give a little introduction uh, to, to start off our presentations. Okay, thank you, Shannon, and hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carolyn Nelson, and I am from the Federal Highway Administration, and I want to talk to you a little bit about um, ensuring equity as we uh, go about using virtual public involvement. So once I get my screen up, if someone could confirm that they can see it. Yep, we're seeing your screen. If you just want to launch your PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. Go All right. Okay, great. Um, I'm not sure if my camera will go off, but hopefully it is not a distraction um, seeing me, if you can see me. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about ensuring equity in virtual public involvement coming um, to you from the perspective of the Department of Transportation, specifically Federal Highway Administration. Um, First, to give you a little bit of information about public involvement. Um, public involvement is critical in, in everything that we do. So I won't talk a lot about it, but just to let you know that it is important. It is a huge and critical component in the transportation decision-making process because it allows for people to provide meaningful input to the projects that we do. It can accelerate project delivery and it can also help us reduce delays from unknown interests interest later in the uh, project development process. However, as you can see here on the screen, sometimes it is a struggle to live up to a um, public meeting to keep people interested. And also it can, it can like the component of having a diverse audience. Now I'm sure most of us have been to public meetings that look a little bit like what you see on the screen. You have lower than hoped for attendance as well as disappointing engagement levels. But however, despite um, all of these things, it is important to note that public involvement is still very important, but trying to um, secure public involvement across a diverse landscape of participants can be a significant challenge. So one of the things that we look at at uh, Federal Highway is virtual public involvement outreach. And we have an effort now called VPI, which I'll talk a little bit about, but it's basically virtual outreach for public involvement. And we started this effort prior to our um, current condition of social distancing within this um, safety realm that we are in, but virtual outreach basically helps us address all types of communities. It includes underserved communities. Um, it, this, it includes, which is the younger, um, I would say 20 to 40 groups, oftentimes not included. Uh, it includes young professionals that are just too busy to go to a public meeting, early to mid-year professionals, stay-at-home moms, college students, as well as the elderly. When you do a virtual outreach, it has the propensity to meet dozens of people to help ensure equity in your project um, processes. Now, virtual meetings, again, they bring everyone together because you can 
you can interact in the meeting wherever you are, however you want to, and it's not a mandate on how you do that. So virtual meetings are one of the uh, things that are starting now, but it is going into the future and it is not going away uh, from the federal standpoint. Now, how do we, why do we do this? We do this to basically look at having equity within our transportation systems. Now, it's important to note though that equity does not mean equal. When you're talking about an equity transportation network, you're looking at trying to get a fairness and mobility and accessibility to meet the needs of everyone in the community. For our history in transportation, we have typically met the needs of the more affluent people in the community. Honestly, we have not necessarily met all of the needs for people in the community. So you're talking about low income, minority, elderly, children, LEP populations, which is limited English proficiency, as well as persons with disability. But again, as you look at this, you, you need to make sure that when you say an equitable transportation system, you're not, you're maybe not talking about an equal transportation system. You want to consider certain things and I have a visualization to help show you that. Here's a visual of equality versus equity. Now on the left hand side of the screen, that is an equal situation. The goal here on both sides is to see the baseball game. On the left hand side of the screen is equal. Everyone has one crate, fell in the blue shirt, fell in the red shirt, fell in the purple shirt. Everybody has one crate. The fell in the purple shirt is not enjoying the game. However, on the right hand side of the screen, you see an equitable situation. The fellow in the blue shirt doesn't have anything because he doesn't need anything to see and enjoy the game. The fellow in the red shirt still has his one crate. The fellow in the purple shirt has two crates. That is an equitable situation for him. It does not mean everything is equal. Now, to help you attain an equitable transportation network, we recommend that you look at the components such as Title VI, Environmental Justice, NEPA, and various other non-discriminatory laws to make sure that you are achieving that equitable system. Now, engaging traditionally underserved communities, there's a few key things to keep in mind there. Um, you need to make sure that you have equitable ac access for everyone. Again, those groups that I mentioned earlier, minority, low-income children, elderly, the disabled. You want to increase opportunities for the underserved communities to be engaged. You want to make sure that they feel that they are part of the decision-making process as you are moving forward. And then oftentimes, I would say, some, you know, when possible, even with virtual outreach, use a combination of traditional and virtual methods because you want to make sure, again, that you are addressing all persons in the community to make sure that it is reaching your information is reaching everyone that it should be touching. You have to keep in mind also that historically, many minority and low-income communities have a community history that has led to an absence of trust with the government. So the concerns of those groups cannot be ignored now in 2020 in our decision-making process. Because of the things that has been done to them in the past, there, it has fostered a suspicion and distrust of the government. They're very skeptical about their opinions being taken. So we have to make sure that we overcome certain barriers, including language barriers, as well as cultural barriers when we are looking at public involvement as well as virtual public involvement. Now, what Federal Highway has done is to coin something called virtual public involvement, and we have outreach efforts for that. And I'm, I'm not going to, going to hit on all of the tools, but I'll talk a little bit about the ones that um, we are putting out to the public and that you will find on our FHWA website. Now, our virtual public involvement tools, we categorize them into eight different tools. We don't specifically talk about one particular tool, but we do make it easy enough for all of the states to kind of look at the tools that are available for virtual public involvement. Now, they include mobile applications, project visualizations, do-it-yourself videos, crowdsourcing tools, town hall, virtual town hall meetings, mapping tools, all-in-one tools, and digital tools to enhance in-person events. Now, I will touch very briefly on the three that's highlighted because they can be best utilized in underserved communities to help with a more equitable um, outreach for public involvement. The first one I'll talk about is mobile applications. This is a wonderful tool for underserved communities as far as virtual outreach, because if you're talking about minority and or low income and or young, um, even with some elderly 
everyone has a cell phone. I have two children, grown adults in their 20s. They don't move around the house without the cell phone in their hand. I have one and I usually know where it is. Theirs is always either in their back pocket if not in their hand. Um, the Delaware Department of Transportation uses mobile apps to do a variety of things um, as far as um, letting people know when public meetings are happening, letting people know where projects are, even as far as letting people know where certain charging stations are for um, electric vehicles. All about uh, events and workshops that are upcoming, they use a mobile app to communicate with the public about what's going on within the state. And it is a wonderful tool for underserved uh, communities to help ensure or equity. Another tool that I highlighted of the eight is project visualizations. I love project visualizations because project visualizations can complement and enhance your in-person engagement as well as other virtual public involvement techniques. Now visualizations, I would say, are particularly useful for involving the public in the project development and design phases. And that's really because visualizations provide a greater sense of what the proposed project will accomplish and it makes it more real to stakeholders and your general public. When, you, when you're standing there talking to people about a roundabout, um, everyone doesn't know what a roundabout is and how does it work? What does it look like? So a, a visualization helps people to understand what you're talking about at your meetings. And the one good thing about project visualizations, it can explain a project to anyone regardless of their background or their prior knowledge of the project or of the transportation system. Great tool. And um, I think the last tool I highlighted here was the virtual town halls. Again, another wonderful tool for outreach to people because you can, um, you can become involved in virtual town halls no matter where you are. If they're having a town hall about the budget, about upcoming projects, these are really good in the planning phase. You can just log on with your television or your iPad and actually hear a town hall discussion as well as uh, submit comments and questions for um, transportation officials to answer and address right at that time during the meeting without you having to physically be in that space. So again, our website um, has VPI, which virtual public involvement fact sheets on all eight of the tools that I'd previously mentioned. Um, please feel free to take a look at it. Um, these are just four of the eight um, fact sheets that we've produced for virtual public involvement. And here is um, my contact information, carolyn.nelson at dot.gov, as well as our website information for how to get to our FHWA VPI website. It has a plethora of information and videos and interviews about virtual tools for public involvement, how best to use them, as well as how to get in contact with us. So um, on that, I will turn it back to um, Shannon and yep. C. Yeah. Thanks, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Yanisa for a little bit of talk on equity. Thank you, Shannon and Carolyn. Let me share my screen really fast. Uh, cool. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, see. So hi, um, my name is Yanisa Teixeira-Camton. I am um, an associate with Nelson Nygaard. Um, and Nelson Nygaard is a transportation consulting um, firm and we mostly do uh, transportation planning. So I mostly work on public transit projects um, with a special focus on equity and climate. Um, so what I want to kind of talk to you all about today is a series of equitable public engagement principles that um, my colleague Naomi Dorner, who's our director of uh, equity, diversity and in inclusion for the firm, and I um, uh, wrote up at the beginning of the pandemic and our motivation for writing these up um, stem from the fact that when everything um, kind of switched to being virtual, um, when like stay, stay at home orders were put in place, um, people uh, were kind of asking industry why, like what tools can we use um, to do public engagement now that everything's virtual and we can't hold traditional public meetings. And um, Naomi and I wrote this up to um, basically take a step back to before we just like look at all the tools that are available, um, like what we should go into um, into engagement with and virtual engagement with like what principles should we be looking at before we even select a tool. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about that. So 
basically, um, we came up with a um, series of uh, principles kind of divided into four categories. Um, part one is um, how to identify the goals and communities impacted um, by public engagement and our different projects. Um, part two, um, considering these communities while actually designing, de designing the um, public engagement methods, um, applying those equitable methods, and then evaluation and follow-up. So for part one, identifying goals and communities impacted, um, the principles we, here, here are the two principles we outlined. One is um, to identify the project goals, resources, and accountability measures for inclusive public outreach and engagement. Um, and what this means is um, from the moment you initiate the project, um, if you want a project to be like truly equitable, um, that requires putting in resources usually both staff time and money and also um, just like having that as your goal from the very beginning of the project and it's not really something that you can add on and have it actually be meaningful um, later on in the project. Um, and um, the accountability measures are so that um, you are kind of evaluating your own project or your client's project throughout the whole process to make sure that um, this goal of like having equitable public engagement stays true for the whole project. Um, second, we have um, identifying who the most vulnerable communities are that the project will potentially impact. Um, as a consultant, um, I work in projects all over the country and each country or each city, each town, each suburb has a very different context in terms of like the histor historical and current injustices that are in place. And um, each community has been impacted in a different way and each project um, influences like if we're talking about transportation planning projects, for example, each of those projects, depending on the geography, the type and everything, influences different communities in different ways. So it's important to know who you're trying to serve through your projects. And then part two, so considering these communities that you've identified, like how do you design the actual methods? Um, so first of all, um, we, um, first of all, uh, designing, um, outreach and engagement methods around the project's most vulnerable communities. So yeah, once you identify those communities, be sure that your methods are um, like fit those communities. One, in terms of community penetration. So the level of traction each tool and method will reach um, accessibility, that's ADA, but also like language and cultural relevancy and then user friendliness. So like how universally understood is the tool or the language that you are trying to communicate them. And then um, step uh, part two that we have is um, this might not be available to all projects, but it's um, important to pay if you can pay representative organizations and community leaders to provide focus input on um, your methods and tools for engagement, um, because it's important to recognize that when people are giving you input, um, especially communities and organizations that like have so much other things to be focused on, like time is money and time is valuable. So it's important to compensate people accordingly. And then lastly, um, weight and prioritize input and criteria provided by vulnerable communities. Um, as you all probably know in public meetings, the loudest voice in the room might not be the ones that you're actually trying to serve or the ones that you, you need to listen to. And some of the quieter ones or the ones who aren't even there are the communities that you're trying to serve. So be sure to weigh and prioritize those input over potentially the loudest voices in the room. Cool, so part three, applying the methods. Um, I guess one thing uh, before um, selecting the methods that I wanted to know is that analog strategies and tools can be just as innovative and effective as digital tools. Um, I feel like there was a tendency when we went into the pandemic that like, oh, we have to do everything digi digitally now. Um, and that's um, not always true. And digital tools are really, really helpful for some groups and not as helpful for other groups. And um, and analog strategies such as like posters, phone banking, printouts, mail, ma like mail outs um, can be accessible to folks as well. And to give an example, um, there's still a lot, like, cause I mostly work on public transit projects, the most essential workers and like a lot of vulnerable communities are still taking transit and a poster at a bus stop might reach them a lot more than say something out of a social media account or um, like a notice on a website because they'll be at the same bus stop every day still. Um, 
And then secondly, even if you're using different tools to try to reach different groups, be sure to be consistent with your messaging um, because uh, you wanna make sure that everyone's getting the same like information so that they're the most informed and across the board. And then lastly, for this section, um, uh, we have a principle of just like being creative because a lot of this work is really hard, especially in like changing pandemic conditions. And also um, there's gonna be like new ideas that maybe like, for example, the youngest team member of your team might have that might work out even if it's not something that's been done before. Cool. And then the last section that I have is um, the importance of evaluating and following up after the engagement. And this is really crucial for building trust between your agency, your company, um, just whatever entity you are with the groups you're trying to serve. Because um, uh, projects are, like project timelines are not how relationships work. It's like the relationships will continue past the project timeline and probably have some sort of, um, like we're started before the project timeline. So if you are asking for specific input for a project, it's good to, it's a good practice to kind of keep that group um, updated as you go through the project. So if you're asking for public input at the beginning of the project, reach out and update to the same people for later stages because they will likely have a vested interest in knowing what happens with their input. And then um, once the project is done, um, there's likelihood that you, um, you and this community, this organization will partner again for a later project. And then the last principle we want to acknowledge is um, basically like acknowledge, document, and forgive mistakes. Um, equ equity work is hard, public engagement is hard, and um, it's good to be sure to basically document what you did so like fu future you and future um, colleagues that come after you know what you did, both good and bad, and then um, know that you won't be able to get it perfect every time, but it's, um, but it's a relationship building is a process and not an end goal. Yeah, and then, so I also just wanted to give my contact information, that's my email. And then I will also, um, once I pass it back to Shannon, drop the link to our, uh, we have like a web page and a PDF of the principles for equitable public engagement that um, you can also use however you see fit. Great, thank you. Thank you, Yunisa. And then uh, finally, we'll turn it over to Allison to talk about how this uh, these two thought, thoughts from Carolyn and Anissa have kind of come into play in practice uh, at the DDRPC. Great, thank you. Um, make sure my presentation is showing. Um, so similar to what Carolyn and uh, Yasnisa have said before, uh, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are kind of reinforce the principles um, or the uh, the examples of virtual public in involvement and making sure we're hoping to um, that we're reaching more voices, more diverse voices. So I'm going to um, look at present two examples, um, one that was spring 2020, uh, long range plan, we do long range planning at DVRPC, which is really hard uh, for public engagement because we're asking people to look so far out into the future. And most people, um, myself included, um, think a lot about more short term, like what's happening, especially like what's in their backyard, what's around them. So it's hard to get people um, who are not planners, not engineers, is not a part of transportation planning uh, to think about you know what the future them or the future like what what kind of things are we going to need to invest in now to be uh, feasible in 2050 um, and then happening right now so this is a project that we're doing right now um, around Ben Franklin Bridge uh, in city of Philadelphia so I'll talk about some of those tools that we're using or techniques that we're using So uh, really just I um, wanted to say like Yaniza talked about um, creating these principles to then look at uh, different tools uh, for public involvement, which is really funny just to share with you all that we are 
um, we didn't choose Zoom specifically for public involvement before the pandemic, but we already had it in place. And we are actually really, really fortunate that we already had it in place um, because uh, once you like learn the tool and learn all the added features, it's uh, it creates it's very porous. It's very easy to for us to like reach a lot of people. And also the way it's designed as like an app, people can have it on their tablets, on their phones, or just in a browser, um, which is really exciting. So a lot of people ask like, oh, what do you use? We use we use Zoom, and we're getting a lot out of it. All right, so our long range plan, um, we're in the visioning process right now, March 22nd, uh, which probably a lot of us remember is like when uh, governor of New Jersey, city of Philadelphia, um, and then I think PA was a couple of days later made the, the lockdown like quarantine um, orders. So we had to pivot our, all of our visioning outreach that we were like planning to launch in April as all in person. We had to pivot it all to um, online. And so we did, a, we really tried to take what we wanted to accomplish um, in person, we had to transition that to online. And so we really wanted to create these like, um, engagements or experiences in person. So we focused a lot on like, how would you do that online? So um, we did a video, um, you know, trying to get people more interested or giving them background before an engagement, before an involvement. Um, we did a very massive social media campaign and we um, we basically took the money that we were thinking we were going to spend for like venue rentals and put that towards um, social, like a very uh, dynamic social media campaign on multiple platforms that also like engaged like a person multiple times. It's so, like when an, when an ad starts following you around on web pages. So our social media coordinator figured out how to do that for, <laughs> for us. Um, and so we were really trying to reach like, like outside of our network um, to hear from more voices in the greater Philadelphia area. Uh, we were going to go to where people already are meeting. So what we call road shows, we were going to go to different um, community organizations that serve harder to reach com uh, communities, populations, vulnerable populations, um, people of color. Uh, we already had those contacts. We were excited to like get on their agendas, do a 20 minute exercise, distribute a survey uh, and collect all that great data about what they think about the, the vision for 2050. So we had to turn turn that to online. And, and we were actually really surprised. A lot of these organizations all spread out throughout the, the nine county region that we serve, they had pivoted to online. A lot, a lot of them. So um, a lot of the ones that we wanted to meet in person, we got to meet uh, on Zoom. And we also found that people um, were looking for something else to talk about besides the pandemic, especially like April, May, June. So they were really excited to be able to engage with one another. If they hadn't used Zoom before, um, they were really happy to see their colleagues, their friends from this organization. And so we spent a lot of time like getting to know people. It was awesome. Um, and then we did public workshops on Zoom too. Um, and uh, that's when, and that's the bottom right. Um, and that's when we you know, made the same uh, thing available, see who came. It's usually people inside our, our, our network already um, and got their feedback. So it resulted, um, and we did an online um, survey as well. We made it available in uh, Spanish and we mailed out hard copies, um, especially to like key networkers uh, who uh, are still, especially during the pandemic, we're still interacting with community members. So we knew that they were going to distribute them when they wanted to distribute paid um, or surveys uh, out to folks. We made it a mailer with a self-addressed um, envelope so that we could, <laughs> we could get them back. Uh, so, so from all of that work, um, we reached 700 unique individuals um, for one question that we asked, you know, to everybody, that consistent messaging that Yanisa was talking about. Um, we, so that one question, we got over 1,300 open-ended responses for like what people imagine Greater Philadelphia to be in 2050. You know, we do qualitative coding, so transportation, they, like, all different types of like what they see the transportation infrastructure 
infrastructure or service uh, or AVs, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, um, all of that was like one of the top the top themes and then equity by far um was our second and and it, when we did this five years ago it it was lower on the list um so uh people i think are are very con more conscious than they were maybe five years ago of inequities and also maybe um the, the privileges that some people have and others don't not to mention racism so so um that was really for someone who does a lot of this work, environmental justice work and public engagement work, this is like really exciting. <laughs> uh, and then to go into another study area, another study as an example, this is the Ben Franklin Bridge. Here's the study area on uh, the right. And this connects Philadelphia to Camden City, New Jersey. Um, it's right in uh, Old City or the historic area of Philadelphia. It's right next to Chinatown um, in Philadelphia. So the, the study area contains like three really different neighborhoods um, that are probably definitely going through um, changes all the time and also are figuring out how to change, how they want to change. And um, we, obviously could not do in-person public involvement, even when Philadelphia started to go through different, and Pennsylvania started to go through different shades. I just don't think it's it's uh, responsible to, <laughs> to bring outsiders into a community during a pandemic. So we were um, all cognizant of that. Um, and then these three communities are, are incredibly active uh, and, com and com incredibly organized. And then Chinatown has a history of being ignored, marginalized, and literally bulldozed by transportation, by government. 676, the Vine Street Expressway, like went through their community despite lots of protests, despite organizing. So there is a big suspicion about government. There's a huge distrust of transportation. Um, and uh, and so we have to on, we have to recognize that and recognize our role in that. Uh, whether we I was a part of it or not, I have to recognize the role uh, that that trauma plays in that community. And so they want more information as much as possible. So what did we do? <laughs> Um, we threw everything in the kitchen sink at it. Um, this is like one of those outreach uh, plans that's like on steroids, on stimulants, on caffeine, whatever, whatever means uh, like we're, we're throwing everything at it. Um, so we're doing everything in English and simplified Chinese uh, and Spanish. Uh, we created these web maps to create uh, to collect input. So to do simplified Chinese and Spanish, we have to do like three web maps um, because the web map technology isn't there for translation yet. Um, again, we did a social. We're doing a social media campaign to get people to the web map. Uh, then, because there's a ton of people that are outside of our networks, might not use social media, might not use the social media that we use, um, we uh, are doing a postcard mailing to get more people to the web map. You know, we pulled addresses from uh, Open Data Philly. We drew the study area. It's really easy to pull um, addresses. The harder part is like figuring out what's an apartment building or not. So we're doing a mailing to ask, basically ask people to go to our web page that appears in three different languages and then go to the web map for them. Um, then this is like <laughs> so exciting to me. Um, let me go on to the next slide. So then, um, oh, and we created a video in and with translation subtitles in it. If people have never interacted with a web map, or not. Here's an example of the postcard that we're doing. You don't have to design three postcards. You just have to really like do the call to action in the in the languages that you're translating into. Um, and then they will find the language on the web page that um, you know that they can read that they prefer to communicate in. Um, then this is like so crazy. I love when folks do this. Uh, they have a they had a easy link to for people to sign up um, 
to get more information about the project. So we're not project sponsors as planners. So we want to make sure that we're creating this really good um, database that we can hand off to the city of Philadelphia, to DRPA, to the project sponsor who might be changing the, the eastbound access to Ben Franklin. Um, so this is my favorite thing when people collect info. And, and also after that, uh, we sent them to a survey to collect demographic information and uh, like tell us like how is this engagement uh, involvement activity for you? Like how would you improve it? Like so we even like put in an evaluation component, which I'm super psyched to see those results because that's always like the hardest thing to go back to. So we planned it right from the start to it build that evaluation in it. So um, last time I got the stats from the team, the uh, just between like just in a month, uh, the website got 25,000 web views and that's like multiple views, that's not unique users. Um, so people going back and forth on the web map, like that type of stuff, it's not unique. We had 90 original comments on that web map. And then the way, for some reason, the way we do our, our web maps, um, we let people like do comments on comments. <laughs> so we have an additional 70 on comments. It's not quite upvoting, but it's like, I guess, a comment on a comment. So, and there's my contact information. So kind of like what Carolyn and Yanisa said, like we're doing, we're throwing everything at it. We're doing um, traditional and uh, virtual, and we're really trying to look for uh, communities that we haven't uh, been able to engage with before. And because it's virtual, we're, we're, we have more opportunity, I, I personally think. I'll turn it back to Carolyn now, or Shannon, I'm sorry. I'll turn it back to Shannon. Thanks, Allison. And uh, so I just want to, we're now going to move into the open discussion portion of the presentation. So please, as you have questions, go ahead and put those in the question and answer pod, um, and we'll be happy to, to kind of work through those. Um, so the first question here, Yanisa, you did work in graduate school on, uh, on equity, and that was what your, your thesis was based on. Can you kind of provide us with a working definition of equity and, exam and, and an example of what this looks like in the context of public meeting? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the way I like to think of equity is that the term is like, it's like the quality of being fair and just, but also recognizing that there's a lot of like historical and social structures that have contributed to like unfairness and injustices. So fair and just, and then like actively compensating for like previous and current injustices. Um, and then when it comes to public meetings, I think first it's important to recognize that getting like good public input is just one portion of making sure a project's equitable. Um, the like there's different ways of doing your analyses and um, like catering the final report or things like that, that are also a big factor. Um, but when it comes to public engagement itself, it's like, it's kind of um, being equitable and, and public meetings, public engagement is making sure you are, I think the, the piece that's important is like targeting um, vulnerable communities that have been really um, like structurally and historically um, under invested, underserved um, in the past and making sure that their input, like that they have a really active say in the project um, more so than just like some type of like you as the government is informing them kind of relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting concept to, you know, the e equity doesn't start, doesn't stop at the, at the public involvement, right? Like that's mm -hmm. a interesting thing about equity throughout the process. Um, Carolyn, Allison mentioned that they they use social media and kind of you know, use the common thing that we all find so you know, potentially creepy, but also uh, very useful for advertising on social media, kind of tr tracking people with ads across the internet. So, so Carolyn, are there, um, it's a great opportunity. Are there any common pitfalls that agencies should be mindful of when using social media? Is there any way that they should or should not target their ads? Anything to think about there from the federal government's perspective? Um, yeah, in terms of social media, it, it can be um, a two-edged sword. It is, it is a great way to get information out there, but you do, when you have virtual meetings, 
and I would say a particular like a virtual hearing and hearings, you have to respond to everyone's comments. And sometimes comments can get a bit graphic. So that is a that is something you have to watch out for people. Some of the things that people say because either they think it's funny or they may actually feel that certain way. There's there's no filter. So sometimes you have to be the filter for um, the comments and, and whatnot that you get in with social media. Um, but even saying that, we still think that it is it's the wave of the future as far as communication to the public. Um, we don't want people to feel like uh, in-person meetings are, are going away 100%, but virtual outreach will definitely be a bigger, a bigger um, element of what we do from here on out. So you just, you just kind of have to watch the comments that you get in and, and just be mindful of those. And um, from a federal perspective, we do not tell people that they need to address them um, in any way. And we actually recommend that you do not address comments that are um, either inconsiderate or should not have been submitted. Interesting. Wonderful. And so now you're mentioning like in, in hearings, you know, or public comment periods, there are, there are certain requirements about responding to some comments. So if you had a hearing on, on YouTube that was streaming on YouTube, for instance, mm -hmm. um, would you then if that hearing were, were a public hearing where you needed to respond to comments, should you be responding to all of the comments that come in via the YouTube uh, stream as well? So any typed comments, would those need to be responded to? They have to be responded to in the environmental document, not necessarily right at that time. Like if someone comes up and asks a particular question about it, but if you, typically if you're streaming information for a hearing, you're getting information out to the public. But any comment that comes into the chat or however the state decides to accept comments, they do have to be addressed in the environmental document one, one way or the other. And, and that's the, because we have to certify that that portion of the hearing was done, it was held, we heard people's comments and we addressed them. So, but at the actual meeting, um, it would be kind of impossible. Sometimes you might get upwards of 200 comments. So right. there may be certain things where, you know, certain times people will want to say something that they want everyone to hear. Other times they'll just want, they'll type in a comment for a hearing and then they know it'll be addressed in the environmental document. Can I add to that too? Yeah. You can like, so think about how, so public comment periods are especially important you know, we put out all these different ways that we, that we want people to contact us. Tools, the tools have lots of controls. So you don't have to, if you put something out on YouTube, you don't, you can disable comments. Um, so, and a lot of public agencies do that because it's like another, it's another thing that you have to monitor um, and moderate. Um, so that's also something to think about is like, Maybe we do accept comments for streaming, but not uh, for a standalone, uh, for a video that's ever evergreen, right? We'll disable the comment section for the evergreen videos because we don't want to have to monitor that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, Allison, kind of turning the, the to, to the complete opposite side of the spectrum, you, your conversation last week, you had mentioned about going low tech or old school public outreach talked a little bit about this in your presentation today. Um, any specific things to keep in mind there uh, that that you found that increased response rates, such as, you know, pre you, you mentioned pre addressed uh, envelopes, but also prepaid postage, uh, things like that, that help it your your response rates. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If you're doing a survey, you have to have a paper survey. You have to have a, a way to get it back to you. Otherwise, you just wasted everybody's time. Um, so designing something that's foldable, um, that has your address. And like for um, government organizations, a lot of us have uh, USPS permit uh, numbers, you know, that we keep money in <laughs> for the post office. Um, so that's my biggest thing. Um, or ha handing out an envelope with the survey um, that's pre-addressed, pre-stamped. -pre so that's my big thing is that like, if you're giving out a survey, have a way to get it back. Yeah, wonderful. Our question here from the audience. So when we're thinking about virtual public involvement, um, how do we balance the, 
the need to reach people who maybe don't have time to come in person to events, but also balance that with the needs of people who don't have access to the internet. Um, can we assume that everyone has a cell phone? Um, what, you know, using both the traditional and the virtual involvement strategies are great, but some project budgets can only support one or the other. So um, I'll toss it out for, it wasn't directed at a specific speaker. So if anyone wants to chime in. Um, I can I can chime in um, with VPI from the federal perspective, um, and I was actually typing in an answer. Um, we do have a, a a huge issue about reaching people that may have low broadband, like out in rural areas, um, and making sure that we are not missing them. Mobile phones is a way to do it. Um, not everyone has a mobile phone, but I would say we, we our studies have found that upwards of 90% of the population, even with low income, has a cell phone. I mean, I thought that was pretty shocking, but they do. Um, however, we still have other uh, things that we would recommend for those that live way out in rural areas. You know, there are their mom and pop type uh, businesses or you know farms or whatever what we tell um, the states to do to do their outreach is to make sure that when you do have um, you might want to have in certain rural areas an in-person component to your outreach it doesn't mean that you can't stream it somehow using facebook live or youtube or whatever you want to do for the other population but if you know you're in a rural setting that has low broadband then you may have to uh do a, that type of in-person meeting now if you still wanted to say well you know what it's not a hearing because if you're doing a hearing you have to have an in-person component if it's just a public meeting and you're trying to get information out there but you want to reach everyone um typically even in a rural area people will come into town, uh, quote unquote, to get things or buy things. Where do they go or where could they go locally to access a computer or to access um, something where they could connect into your um, virtual meeting if you didn't want to have the in-person or you or you couldn't afford to have the in-person as well as the virtual meeting. Where could they go like a library, a chamber of commerce, or maybe even a school where you set up computers um, that could have uh, a way to actually help with outreach of, of the people that you want to talk to? And something I kind of want to add on that something that Nelson Nygaard has been doing more and more is telephone town halls um, and telephone public meetings. And um, that can either be separate from like, say, a traditional Zoom webinar or meeting or combined. And um, for those who don't know what that is, it's like, it's basically an info, info session of some sort, but all through the telephone so that people don't need to have internet, they can just call in. And I would say like, if 90% of people have internet service through a mobile phone or something, it's probably like, way higher that have at least just like calling functions on their phone um, or have a phone. And um, and we've done that either like just providing a call-in number to whatever Zoom meeting um, and making sure that our speakers are like not referencing something on the PowerPoint or whatever. That's just that like they're saying everything that is written on the PowerPoints and it's not um, just, we're not assuming that everyone can read it. Um, or we have like a separate um, session that is only for telephone people so that people so so that it's like you're just talking into the phone about your project right like a, is the virtual town hall that that I show on the slide was a virtual town hall where you can either see it or you can actually call in just as she was saying and you can hear it but you could still talk to someone on the other end and leave a comment All that's right. a good question yeah um you mean, so, so, you know, Allison was talking about a project that is, you know, 2050 visioning, it's far into the future, and even projects that are happening today, we know have impacts that are far in the future. Um, one of the equity principles that you put forward was identifying who the vulnerable communities are that the project will impact. And so when the impacts are far in the future, it becomes you know, that much more difficult to kind of identify who those communities are and who they may be in the future. Um, how do you go about the process of starting to determine who the vulnerable communities are either at this moment or could be in the future? Yeah, um, so, I, so I guess for a lot of the projects I do um, for public transit planning, um, 
we often start a project with like something we call a market analysis, but that can also be done informally. And that's basically like doing the due diligence to understand the area that you're planning in and like the people who live there, um, which is easier for people who like, which is sometimes hard for consultants who kind of just like go into an area and like don't really have the lived experiences of living there, but might be easier for um, like government officials and people who are working locally. Um, but something that I, it's kind of just like the the due diligence of basically like the research of like um, which like groups of like what demographics live in the areas in terms of race, income, disability, age, all of that, and like what neighborhoods they live in. And also um, like what have previous like harmful government practices been um, with, for example, redlining, um, highway construction that cut through neighborhoods, um, urban renewable, urban renewal, all of that. And then I think one thing I want to offer that like basically every time I start a new project, if it's in a different city that I'm not familiar to, um, I like to pull up, uh, I think this is like website that kind of shows you, it's like a racial dot density map where it's basically like a map of the US um, and you can zoom into the city and it shows like the uh, racial distribution of that city and you can kind of see where the segregation exists and where like people of color live which are usually the more underinvested areas and like that I feel like that always gives me a like better understanding of the city. Yeah I think I've seen that map before it like takes the census population and kind of plots it or something. Yeah. Um, do you if you if you can find it maybe you can drop it in the chat yeah. for, for folks that would be helpful. Uh, it's a really interesting very interesting website. Um, just a note on the last question here John sent in and said uh, that um, you know piggybacking on other public meetings or events can be really effective. Uh, school board meetings, church services, displays at other community events or higher profile project meetings. Um, kind of what Allison was talking about with that road show aspect of, of or, or even tying in with, right, Allison, you talked about um, other community organizations that maybe um, aren't drawing huge crowds of people but they're drawing specific crowds of people um and and tying in there we had a question from joanna she asked um how do you collect and evaluate the input to make sure that underserved communities are appropriately represented in your results often you have groups that flood the open house and may overshadow the views of other users so it's kind of a little bit tying into that evaluation piece how do you know that your outreach to underserved communities has been effective. Um, and I'll, that was directed at a, at a specific panelist, so I'll toss it out to anyone who, uh, who has thoughts. Well, in person, we, we would do flash surveys, like here, tell us here, just tell us your demographics, how you heard about this, right? So, and that's really useful. And we always compare it to um, the census uh, air, like area. Um, one thing that's really interesting, we just did this, uh, we, in person we had, this was a, like a study for an open house for a, a potential PA turnpike um, uh, exit ramp or, so in person the open house was flooded by people who were against the, the possibility of, of creating a new ramp. On, online, like nine months later, um, we were we were prepared for that same group to come back. We we heard overwhelmingly that they wanted the the ramp because it was like an incomplete ramp. Um, so you could like get on one way, but you couldn't get off in the same area. So like the actual residents were like, <laughs> like no, we want this. So that was like amazing to have that difference of like in person, um, and that and all. And how people like rallied around, like distributed uh, information to get people to flood that open house, versus online, where we really re relied on like the municipalities to distribute the information to their residents, and um, and the residents came out. So it's always about like collecting that information, asking people for their zip codes, um, as a way also to do a proxy for for income level, how people work, um, like what their status of employment is, but getting it in front of them as soon as possible is really important. Great. We had a question come in. With virtual public involvement, we're seeing a much higher numbers of people providing input and getting engaged. 
Um, are planners and engineers going to be able to synthesize the volume and broad range of input that we can receive and effectively use the input for the project? Are there any tools or recommendations, especially when trying to combine both VPI and traditional methods? So maybe, um, Carolyn, I'll send this to you first, and then we can we can kind of go around the the horn. But um, do any of your tools address that, or or have you heard from from other state agencies of how they're addressing that with with, with virtual public involvement, you're just getting so many more comments to address. Uh, definitely. Um, North Carolina, I will say, for example, um, we have certain um, peers that we use for our VPI uh, webinars, and we can do those at any time. If that's something that um, you or your state would like to do, um, please send me an email, let me know. But North Carolina used something, what we call an all-in-one tool, and they went from having um, you know, maybe 30 or 40 people at their planning meeting, um, which is a pretty good number of people to about 300 people um, virtually. And they were overwhelmed with how many comments they got and how to address it. So one of the things that um, they did was you, you have to have a tool in place that actually helps you capture those comments so that they can be downloaded and addressed and, you know, submitted back out um, in, in that tool at a later time, because it's, it's hard to do it all at one time. There's other tools, I'll say, for example, Connecticut has something called um, Let's Go CT, where um, it is something called a story map, and the information is out there. You pull up the map, very similar to what um, I think Yanisa sent out, um, which is a very cool map, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it, you should click on it, um, where you can actually click on a project, and it brings up the project, and then you can pop your comments right in on the screen, and then what it tells you is that within 24 to 48 hours, um, it'll be addressed, but there, it, a lot of the tools that's being used is more to get information out there. So when you comment, we're not necessarily commenting, uh, providing a comment back to you, but it's helping the transportation professionals, planners and engineers, all of us together um, work to make a better um, project and a better um, alternative to look at based on the public's input. Now, if you are looking for comments to come back to you, we strongly recommend that you realize if you're used to getting 50 comments and you, you know, you want to do a YouTube public meeting or YouTube hearing, one of the first things we say, and that's why this is such a good question, be prepared for the influx of comments that you will get based on doing it virtually, particularly right now. Um, I wouldn't go to anybody's meeting at this particular point, especially if I can get it on my computer, my laptop, my TV, I can pick up a phone. I am not going in person. And um, most people that I know can be quite vocal. So be ready to grab those comments because again, if it's a public hearing, you are mandated to address them. But if it's a public meeting, you don't have to, but sometimes people ask questions where they want an, uh, an answer to. So if you can't get to it right now, and say for example, this format, be able to allow them, you have like all of our email addresses. You can send us an email, you can send an email to Shannon and we can get back to you. Um, that is one of the things um, that we do virtually and let people know, you know that you will have a week or so, give us a week or so to address all of the questions that are coming in and you will have a team of people answering them. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was a great plug actually, because uh, right as you were talking, um, the Penn State representative Steve he dropped in the comments that if people have questions after we're done here, they can email tesc at psu.edu, and they will forward them on to the panelists. So, but it yes. sounds like the the answer is know whether you're going to respond to the comments or just take the comments for your information right. and then plan for it, right? So set aside time the day after or a few days after to really dig into those comments and, and take a look at it, know that they're coming. Right. So, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Allison, one thing I've been hearing a lot about and is one of Eunice's principles for equitable public outreach, it includes paying representative organizations and community leaders to provide input and help with outreach. Um, is this something that the RPC has considered and, and what sort of successes or challenges have you run into? Yeah, um, it's something that we've done when we've had private funding, uh, like foundation funding, we've been able to like contract directly with a community organization um, to do outreach, uh, to have food at a meeting, to uh, give us like returned surveys back or returned like, you know, 
the, uh, the engagement tool back. Um, so that's been really great. And I, I think some foundations really realize that you, uh, you need to like incentivize people. And it's when I say incentivize, it's not, it's not, uh, it has to be really worth it, really worth their time. And for a community organization, a contract and being paid is. Um, for individuals, uh, we we have a public participation task force for our, our commission. Um, the That is an application process. We uh, follow a lot of rules for it, FHWA rules. And, um, and we provide a, a, a stipend for people who attend meetings, either in person or online. Um, and so that is like compensating people for their time. We don't ask their income level. We don't, but we do uh, select uh, for a, uh, an ethnically diverse re, uh, group of people based on the region's economic or uh, profile. Um, so, and some people like turn it down because they don't want it. Some people really need it to be able to come, especially for in-person meetings. So, and we have found that to be like a super strong um, task force that's like only gotten better with time. And I think it's because there's so much like respect there of each other's time and expertise. Wonderful. Well, that, uh, we are right at the, the bottom of the hour here, 3.30. So we're gonna have to end the panel there. But again, if anyone has any additional questions, um, I think all the speakers had their, their information. Um, otherwise, reach out to the TESC at tsu.edu and they can help put you in contact with, with the speakers as well. So thank you all for, for your engagement. Thank you to the speakers and uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day.